Welcome to the Huntsman's Journal Podcast, a hunting story radio show. And now, your host, Adam Huntsman. Welcome to the Huntsman's Journal Podcast, a hunting story radio show. I'm your host, Adam Huntsman, and today we'll be telling you the story of Gaines Slade and his 62-day hunt for grizzly bears in Alaska. Okay, welcome to the Huntsman's Journal Podcast, a hunting story radio show. Thanks again for tuning in, everybody. I'm your host, Adam Huntsman, and today's episode is an episode that I've been dying to release for, I want to say, you know, two months now. Um, we had actually recorded this interview, uh, Gaines and I, several months ago, right whenever this podcast was just getting going, and I wanted to hold off on sharing it until we got a little bit closer to uh, Spring Bear and... Uh, I can't really wait much longer, and it's close enough. So we're going to be bringing you guys this episode today, and like I said, just super excited to uh, to be able to share it with everybody. Now, as far as Gaines is concerned, you know, before we get into anything, just to kind of set the scene, he is a big game hunting. I I, I don't even know if there's a word for it, honestly, but basically, Gaines is as hardcore as they come. He is, you know, he's hunted for. Um, for everything, I mean, you know, mountain goats and tar to caribou, white tails, you know, you name it, he's gone after it. He's an official measurer for Boone and Crockett. He's an official measurer for Pope and Young. He's on a host of different, you know, pro staffs, and you know, again, he's just, he just seems like he's done a lot, um, you know, in in regards to uh, hunting big games. So I'm super excited to have him on the show. And as far as this trip is concerned that he's going to be talking to us about, again, this was 62 days that he spent in the bush filming grizzly bear hunts. So he wasn't behind the trigger. However, he was behind the camera, and I believe he said he had filmed uh, either five or six different grizzly bear hunts in that uh, 62 consecutive days that he spent in the bush. So, again, you guys do the math, 62, 62 days straight. That's a lot of uh, experiences and a lot of stories, and I can't wait to have him on the show so that he can tell us all, all about them. So, let's hop right into it, everybody. This is episode 16, Gaines Slade and his 62-day grizzly bear hunt. Okay, and on the phone with us today is Gaines Slade. How you doing, Gaines? Doing well, Adam. How are you? I uh, you know I can't complain, man. Uh, we've been really looking forward to this uh, conversations, or this conversation, I should say. Uh, yeah, since the last time we talked, I've just been thinking about grizzlies, and yeah, I'm just really looking forward to it. Absolutely, absolutely. Yeah. So I was gonna say, now I gave you a brief introduction uh, before we got on the line here in the intro, but you know I'm sure you could kind of tell everybody about more about yourself than I could. So why don't you go ahead and uh, you know just tell everybody a little bit about yourself? You know what you do, where you live. Uh, you know just kind of kind of kind of high level overview of uh, who Gain Slate is. Absolutely. Yeah. Um, first off, uh, <laughs> Alabama redneck. Uh, self-taught hunter uh, from Alabama originally, the Piney Woods, and uh, didn't have much land growing up or any, and uh, didn't end up being able to shoot my first whitetail until uh, 15, 16, and uh, pretty much hooked from there, got my younger brother into it, and um, from there I went to Auburn, uh, Auburn grad and uh, War Eagle, and I uh, went from there and... Uh, did some small business stuff, non-outdoor related for, for a good little while. Got into, um, got into videography to kind of get into the outdoor industry, uh, in my late twenties. And, uh, I was humping it probably 20, oh, probably 200 days a year, um, out for multiple shows, um, on the outdoor channel sportsman's channel and, uh, just doing outdoor, uh, videography production. And then, uh, did that and ended up getting, you know, meeting a lot of people, made, got some job offers. Brought my small business expertise uh, out here to San Antonio from Alabama uh, in 2013 and um, came to work for Tech and Mighty Seed um, in the wildlife seed market for food plot planting. I had a strong background in that from, from Alabama wildlife management for specifically for white tailed deer. Um, obviously, during that videography stage, it was all kinds of hunts, elk and mule deer, and it's a lot of time behind the lens. And it's, it's an interesting perspective uh, when you're not on a paid hunt, when you're not the shooter, but yet you still need to get the animal, mm-hmm. uh, sort of, sort of speak. Uh, it's, it allows you, 
as a guy who during that time as well was going on a lot of guided hunts or DIY Western hunts and was turning away from the the Eastern whitetail world and starting to realize this is a big world and Africa and doing Africa and going to Africa with my brother for bow hunting and uh, going to Alaska and going to Canada for bears and going and shooting pheasants and, you know, seeing the West, uh, pronghorn and mule deer and so doing all those things and kind of broadening, broaden the scope uh, of your mind for the for you know hunting what's out there. Again, as an Alabama guy, so I moved out here uh, for Chakamadi and was their GM for the last four years, and uh, have recently gone back into production um, here around the turn of the year. Live here in north of San Antonio uh, with uh, my wife to be at, at some point, probably in April. Nice, nice, very cool. Like we were just talking, uh, just talking off air a little bit ago. We'll, we'll we'll both be jumping on that bandwagon here shortly. So that'll be, I'm sure that'll be uh, an adventure in itself. But <laughs> if, she, if she sticks around, yeah. Yeah, yeah, I know, right? Can only ever hope. You never know, man. You gotta, you gotta let, take it as it comes. Yeah, yeah, I hear you. But all right, so now you had said that uh, you're still in, uh, you know, te- uh, San Antonio. Are, are, will you still be working? Are you producing for uh, Tecamati now, or is that going to be? Uh, will you be producing for them and others, or how is that going to go for for the uh, 2017? It'll be for third party people. Okay. Uh, probably uh, a couple of of pretty well known shows, um, and with a full slate of of more of the. Um, <clears throat> non whitetail, uh, more of the uh, adventure type hunts, you know, Spain and turkey hunts and mountain hunts and, you know, oscillated birds and just different kinds of hunts, New Zealand, those kinds of things. So um, hopefully, you know, get out and get some air miles in. Yeah, absolutely. No, I can only imagine going all over the place like that. Like, I, you know, you're talking about, uh, you know how your your eyes had just been open. You're, you're growing up through all this. Uh, your how your eyes were opened up to all the different game species and everything outside of whitetails and turkey and all that. Um, that's kind of where I'm at. Where over the last couple of years, it's been oh, there's all these other cool things that we can look into. Okay, yeah, let's let's go see what this is about. So I mean that I feel like that's even a whole other level. So that's that's fantastic. And um, now before 2013, you had said that you I mean you had already done a lot of traveling around. You mentioned uh, Africa, Canada, Alaska, and uh, Alaska is really what again what we were going to be talking about here today. And uh, that was on a uh, trip that you had said that you had went out on uh, filming grizzly bear hunts. Is that correct? Yes, sir. Yeah, it was when we started planning it. I want to say uh, the gentleman approached me, the outfitter approached me uh, in the fall, late fall of 2012 for the spring grizzly, now not brown bear, spring grizzly bear mm-hmm. season for 2013. Um, and Alaska is kind of interesting, you know, most Western states, as I'm sure your listeners are pretty savvy too, you know, they have units, uh, Alaska has units as well. And certain outfitters kind of make propositions or proposals and get cleared to get into certain units. And, um, the gentleman that approached me is a longstanding outfitter. In Alaska, for a lot of the species, you know, dog, goat, uh, brown bear, grizzly, mm-hmm. um, all the good stuff, everything except caribou he messes with. Um, hmm. And so, and, and, and in Alaska, a non-resident, um, unless there, unless you've got some little in, but for the most part, a, a non-resident in Alaska can go up there and go DIY and a lot of on a lot of species. But you can't go DIY for the bears, brown and grizzly, mm-hmm. uh, and you can't go DIY for the goat or the sheep, mm. uh, to the best of my knowledge. Uh, I'm positive about the bears and the, and the goat, and I'm 99% sure on the sheep. So um, that's just how that goes. I'm sure there's a loophole tag here or there, but the, but the overall situation is you can't roll up there and do that on your own. Um, so so and so that, that's kind of interesting 
Yeah, no, absolutely. Um, and so then you, uh, the outfitter, so basically all, all, all of his guests that were going to be coming into camp, obviously they were going to be going through him and they were going for Grizzlies, like you said. Um, you had mentioned these were specifically Grizzlies and not Brown Bears. Could you explain the, I mean, I, I know that there's some difference between, basically where, where they're located, like where what, the Browns are coastal, is that right? And then Grizzlies are more inland? Exactly. Okay. Yeah, yeah, I'm a, I'm a BNC measure and for Pope and Young as well. And it, it's, it is literally a, a delineation line on a map. Hmm. And that's what it is. So, I mean, if you want to be, again, and I'm far from any sort of biologist, but um, they're not that much of a different animal. They just, I do believe it's, it's they, they could be a small genetic difference, but it's mostly diet-based um, and they are getting bigger. Uh, like Pope and Young and Boone and Crocker both have different minimums mm-hmm. for grizzly and, and browns. And there's a delineation line that, you know, it has to be below this line for, to be a brown bear. Um, if it's in Canada, you know, it's it's a grizzly. Gotcha. Uh, you know, that kind of stuff. So it has to come from that certain little area in Alaska to, to be a brown bear. Gotcha. So we were going for grizzly in the spring. And while we were somewhat near the coast, I mean, they would be, they would be what you would call inland grizzly type thing. I mean, they're not Canada inland, but mm-hmm. um, they they were grizzly bears coming out of hibernation, um, and you know, hundred you know, all spot and stalk type deal. Gotcha. Okay. And I mean, just from, uh, you know, before we move on from this, like the differentiation between the two, I mean, is there, to your knowledge, like, is there any type of difference, uh, like just in their demeanor or are they pretty, like you said, are they literally just same animal, different location on a map? You know, that's a great question. Um, I don't have a ton of experience with grizzlies, just very limited to doing some shoots on Kodiak. Mm-hmm. Um, but uh, again, and very, and wait, let me, oh, no, no experience. Well, one time filming a brown bear hunt. Um, I think there's a couple things happening there uh, with, with brown bear as far as an aggression difference. I, I don't think that's the case. I think they're both aggressive at the right time, mm-hmm. um, given given the right the right situation. I mean, you have to be respectful of what you're dealing with. Um, I think that some of the situations with brown bears is a direct relation to the habitat that they're hunted in. Mm-hmm. Um, a lot of the not not all. Again, this is Alaska is a big state, but a lot of the. Um, a lot of the brown bears, and it's thick and nasty in there. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's up close and personal, and it's certainly up close and personal if you, you know, pop around in him and he, and he, and he doesn't fold up, and yet and a guide, someone, you know, Alaska guide like a Lance who I was with, really good hunter, has to go in there after him. Um, so I think that's some of the horror stories. And then, of course, you always have the big numbers that go with brown bears. Oh, he's 10 foot, and, you know. Mm-hmm. 28 inch skull and this kind of stuff but at the end of the day i would say after my trip up there for those six grizzly bears and having a lot of experience with black bears i've shot three with my bow and then i did the appalachian trail years ago from from start to finish and was dealing with black bears just about the entire time uh that there's a difference in in those two okay 100 percent don't get me wrong, any of them can tear you up, but we we were super aggressive in our hunting tactics on these grizzlies, and they were actively responding to calls and stuff like that. Hmm. Okay. All right. And so then, and again, you were up there for 60 some days, correct? Filming six different hunters. Now, I mean, that's, that's a, that's a long chunk of time. I'm sure that's, I mean, that's just a giant story in and of itself. But I mean, as far as, you know, the individual, you know, I guess sub stories that kind of made up all of this. Well, I I tell you what, let me, let me kind of back up a second. Then we'll kind of dive in and we'll, you know, kind of start at a broad area and then kind of drill down. But um, so, I mean, just kind of as far as the, 
I mean, what you know, you've got to Alaska, you're you're you know getting ready to start you know doing your deal. I mean, you know, what are what are we looking at as far as you know? Are you guys staying in a cabin? Are you guys boating in? Are you flying in? Like, just want to tell us a little bit about uh, you know just base camp basically. Sure, sure. Yeah, the logistical side of it. Yeah. yeah. So, um, it, 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 first off, it all started it, just like most full on like out there kind of trips do with getting your hardware and your gear and knowing what the, you're trying to accomplish. So it started in Alabama, um, working with a company that I think has got pretty popular since then called Goal Zero. Uh, yes, they make yeah. uh, lots of different charging. Uh, solutions for like solar panels that are collapsible because the when Lance approached me the, it was basically um, flat out little little two man mountain hardware four season tents um, out on a knoll you know out on a bluff getting pounded by the wind um, stick the you know the backpack hunt movable I mean a backpack hunt. Basically, you, you commercial flight, if you can call it that, into Unicleet, which is uh, just a um, native people village. It's flying or barging only. There's nothing there. Mm-hmm. Um, and then you get a um, flight out of there, and you go another hour or so north um, via Tundra Plain, Super Cub, and you just land out on the, on the frickin' snow high winds or you know, decently good winds and you go out to these in, inside their unit that they're operating in you go out there and um you 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 set up and it's nothing to it I mean, there's a community tent you know just a hillberg tent hillberg mm-hmm. tent and um and then sleeping tents and like that's it i mean you're just sitting up the glass and it never gets dark um maybe for an hour where you can't glass really really far but it truly never gets dark um, at all, mm-hmm. uh, glassable, just about 24, uh, 22 hours out of the day. So that's, that's a, that's a plus, uh, mm-hmm. sort of, but, uh, yeah, the biggest, the biggest logistical thing was I was going to have to keep a, you know, ENG type camera, a DSLR, multiple GoPros, a laptop, and external hard drives running off of solar power because we were not going back in. Okay. For yeah. That, two months. That so was, that's that's a logistical situation. Yeah. Was, so I basically started in Alabama by getting some goal zeros, rigging the wiring and daisy chaining them together so that I could lay them across the tent. Mm-hmm. And while it never gets dark, it never pounds the sun either. It always stays low. So you have to chase the sun all day to, to keep your 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 hardware and, and your cameras charged. I can imagine that being... But it worked. I mean, at the end of the day, it worked. I mean, the concept was was strong. It, it worked for us. Okay. I wish I would have known about those. I uh, I was in a similar... No, 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 I take that back. It wasn't anywhere close to being similar. I was in a situation, had to, you know, just... You know what? It's not even comparable, so we're not even going to go into it. <laughs> anyway, moving on. Um, everybody needs everybody needs juice. <laughs> exactly, exactly. Yeah, no matter what, just got to keep the batteries going. So <laughs> that's right. <laughs> okay, so all right. But the concept was—I mean, it worked. Um, it worked like a charm. You just had to chase the sun all day and mm-hmm. and be diligent with your cameras. But I mean, we we filmed the whole time. And again, that's two straight months. Basically, you're out there not coming back. Uh, at, at at any point, correct? Yeah, wow. yeah. It's, okay. the, the clients would shuttle in and out, and Lance would go in to get them by law. Um, they'd go in to get them at Unicly, um and, and be there. But uh, the assistant guides and myself would stay out there the whole time. Or when we relocate, I would fly over, get in the tent. He'd fly back to Unicly, get them, and then come to the new spot. Gotcha. Kind of stuff. Gotcha. And now, I mean, as far as relocating, I mean, th- again, this is two months, six hunters. You know, did you have to move around a lot, or for the most part, were you pretty, you know, pretty stationary in a single spot? Uh, there was one honey hole called, you know, labeled the sanctuary, which was just wicked on the wind. But you were you were a hundred yards from a major bluff that looked over a river bottom, and then when I say look over, I mean like miles down to the river 
Mm -hmm. Uh, When you left to go after a bear that was down there, it was a 15 to 20 hour endeavor. Uh, But yeah, we we would ripe on this little rock outcropping and we killed, not from the outcropping, but from that camp, we killed, you know, several of the bears. Um, We relocated for maybe two of them and the rest Mm -hmm. of them came out of that camp. But um, you just relocate via be a plane sure and set up a new camp sure sure okay and and again Alf, i'm trying to paint this mental picture of the landscape oh, you're, we're talking you know you're, you're saying it's mm-hmm. it's obviously cold is there snow on the ground is it kind of uh you know snow in some areas is there a lot of vegetation yeah. uh well yeah what's it look like yeah it is exactly it's 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 snow on the ground um, because it was the latest spring in that area since like the 50s. And they determine that by a pole that they have out frozen in the rivers. And when that pole freezes loose, that's like the beginning of spring. Well, that didn't even happen. Um, it was the latest. It was it was Jeez. late. So it was, it was cold, really, really cold, uh, which was challenging. I mean, don't get me wrong, it had been flowed, but it there was snow, um, snow flurries. The, the the wind was another thing that would push a lot of snow up on us. Mm-hmm. Um, it wasn't like you know head deep type snow that was impassable. Um, it, don't get me wrong; there was areas that weren't getting sunlight that were building up. But um, down in the bottoms, like from off that rock ledge, you'd be glassing up there. It's just rock, snow, nastiness. Uh, you'd glass down, and in the bottoms would be quakies and patches of alders and stuff like that um little scrub scrub brush down by the river because we're looking down on the river Mm -hmm. i mean you're always going to be not always but it's good to be looking at a river a lot of a lot of life and things happen near a river so it's a good hunting technique so yeah we'd be looking down on that but i mean that was a thousand feet below us or 800 feet below us Mm -hmm. um in a lot of cases so We'd be looking down on that, and there'd be snow down there. But, again, it, it truly would have and flow. I mean, there'd be days we'd be out there and, just, and, you know, just a merino wool top, and then there'd be days that you're just <laughs> freaking freezing with all your down stuff on and everything. Mm-hmm. So, again, ebb and flow, and, and the fog would roll in. But um, not not super mountainous. I mean, you're, you're looking up, you're, you're up high looking over a river bottom. That's that's the hunting technique. Get up high, look down on them. Sure. Is that the bear you're looking for? Let's make a move on him. Sure, sure. It makes total sense. You, and you'd said that this was all, uh, you know, a spot and stock, correct? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this okay. is, you know, guys like Lance and his guys, they're world-class guys. I mean, they're looking at bears. And they have clients that are coming to kill big bears. I mean, they're not sure. there. Uh, and they're looking at yeah. bears. And, and bears, in your audience, for relate, bears is one of the hardest things to judge size. Yeah. Especially yeah. lone bears. Uh, like one bear by himself, not a sow and a, and a boar. But these guys are looking at bears, you know, freaking three and four miles out. And they're mm-hmm. like, that's our guy. Or that's not our guy. Wow. Uh, and they just were never wrong. So, I mean, it's just one of those things. It's just, it's a skill set. Mm-hmm. Um learned a lot listening to them how they were doing that but it's it's one of those things that it was it was quite the endeavor to come off there and go after those bears especially with the clients being in some cases uh you know they weren't in the greatest of shape they only have so many of those runs in them sure sure yeah like i said you kind of got to pick your battles then um as far as you know to or, or the, you know the tricks that they had taught you as far as you know picking out the size i mean i know like out of a tr- i mean i my experience is only with black bears and you got a feeder and you know they're 20 yards away but if you're looking at bears that are you know any distance away could you tell us a little bit about like how you would go about even i mean beginning to judge it especially i mean if if, if i'm imagining a giant bear a giant lone bear out there in the snow at a great distance that's got to be super hard so like what would you be i mean what would you be looking for you know honestly that's a great question the only thing that stuck with me that i could tell as i would just sneak a peek through the swarovski or look through we actually had an adapter that 
allowed me to hook my DSLR to the Swarovski and film it. Oh, wow, the, nice. The, yeah, that's pretty legit. <laughs> yeah. Um, the only thing that really stuck with me, other than their gut feeling, having looked at just a ton of bears, mm. was they told me, they said, a really big bear, a boar, feeds out in front of his front legs, and a sow or a smaller boar feeds between his front legs. Really? So, like, he looks like a Tyrannosaurus, uh, Brontosaurus out there. If his neck seems long and way out in front of his body, it's a good... And I'm not talking about gangly. I'm not talking about how a small black bear looks real leggy. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I'm not talking about that. But, like, if that head's hanging real low and swaying and feeding out in front, that was the one thing that I could sort of stay with these guys. Be like, yeah, I do get that. I see that now. And that, and it, 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 when we would ground check them, that would be the case. Hmm. Okay. Interesting. Yeah, I can. I can. Yeah, it was, it was, it was a, it, yeah, if the feet out in front, you know, it's, it could be a big boar. Uh, if it feeds between its legs, it's, you know, more than likely a sow, small boar. Okay. All right. Cool. Well, thank you. Um, all right. So again, we've got got the lay of the land now. You know, scene's kind of set. Um, I mean, of the of the. I mean, I'm sure we, we could probably do an episode on each individual hunt. But I mean, <laughs> <laughs> you know. Um, but as sure. far as like you know, why don't we just start with the most memorable one? Um, you know, tell us a little bit about that. How did it, uh, how did it start? You know, just uh. You know, sure. talk about it. Well, the most memorable one, um, oh, wow. Uh, probably when we relocated, so we had, we were half, we were in the middle somewhere, and um, Lance had got a tag for his wife, and uh, Nikki, who's a really nice lady, and um, somehow, um, he went, when he went back to get her, um, I got relocated, and so I'm flying, or I get on the plane with, um, this gentleman who has been on the Nat Geo and everything. And anyway, he's done this his whole life. Uh, these super cup things, it's, the wind's, you know, okay. It's pretty high, but whatever. We get in this tiny little plane and I'm filming and I didn't know where we were going. I just knew that Lance would be there in a day or two. Cause he's got to fly back. She's got to fly in commercially, uh, and then wait for the weather. And you know, the weather could mess us up for a day or two. Sure. So I had a tent, I had provisions and had a gun and, you know, I don't know. It's it's not one of those things you really think about too much. So I get in the, in the plane with Jim. We're flying, and you know I'm looking. It's just gorgeous. I'm filming, and uh, even in my uh, <laughs> lack of experience, I could tell we were like circling an area. Uh, I don't know. We flew 10, 15, 20 minutes, which is you know a long way to relocate. Yeah, uh, I'll sure. say you've covered a lot of territory. And he, I, I just very nicely into the microphone. Because this was not like a chitty chatty kind of thing. I said, um, "Are we uh, are we looking for something so I can be of use?" And he said, "Yeah, I'm, I'm, I, I can't see it. I, I don't see where 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 it was." And I said, "Where what was?" He's like, "The crash site." I was like, "Oh, good, the crash site. <laughs> That's the name of the place we're going. We're going to the crash site. Yeah, we're going to the crash site. Said, <laughs> okay. Well, um, yeah. So I didn't ask much more, and so he kind of kind of worked it out." I mean, he's been flying his whole life, and he worked it out, and here we come, and we, we do a couple little get close and goes, and um, again, I'm from Alabama, so this is this is a whole thing. I've been in Super Cubs and stuff, but not like this, mm-hmm. and um, and I'm I'm trying to film and stay out of his way, and, and anybody that's been in a Super Cub knows how tight it is in there, um, and you know, they're reaching over to the, in between your legs and trying to pull levers and things like that. You're just trying not to screw the pooch. And finally he puts it on the ground after like the third try. Uh, not not try, but he was trying to be safe. Sure. Puts it on the ground, and I get out. And yeah, I knew for a fact Lance and then were not coming that day. And uh, Bernie was uh, possibly. But anyway, so long story short, um, the wind is just getting it. I mean, it, it's coming. Mm-hmm. Um, and... Um, it, it, and there's nothing out there to stop it. I mean, you're up. He puts it down on a knoll up there where you land a plane. Um, and so I said thanks and bye and uh, get out. And I was like, you know, I have a sat phone, but 
if anybody's used a sat phone, those you don't want to bet your life on a sat phone. It doesn't always work. Uh, <laughs> so, um, yeah, and it, it was cold. I mean, it was cold, and it was a storm coming. And so I said, you know, thanks for everything. He takes off, and I film him taking off. I'm scrambling to film that. And, uh, anyway, so uh, off he goes, and, and I remember thinking immediately, like, as he's flying away, I was like, now this is alone. It was an odd, and I will never forget that because I've done a, a very small in the big scope of things adventures, but I've done a fair amount of adventures, and I've done some stuff by myself, mm-hmm. but very rarely do you truly feel alone, and that happened there. As he's flying away, um, you are all by yourself, and and I do mean all by yourself. You're not walking out of there. You're not going to, there's just no coming out of there. Um uh, so I remember thinking, you know, if I pull this tent out with this wind and it gets away from me, I'll never catch it. I'll never catch it. It'll blow to frickin' Siberia before I catch it. Mm. Uh, and I'm going to be in a bad way, like a bad, bad, bad way yeah. without a tent up here. I'll say, yeah. And uh, so anyway, it was very nerve-wracking setting that tent up, uh, trying to keep the backpack on it and keep a death grip on it with the gloves and the face mask and everything on. Um and I actually let go of the stuff sack for the tent and gone. I mean, just immediately, like, just gone. Just never and, coming back. Just uh, don't even bother. Never looking. coming back. And if that, <laughs> if that was your tent, your, your things just got really crappy really fast, especially if they couldn't come get you before the storm. So I remember taking the most keenness of effort to, uh, to uh, set that tent up and to anchor it down really good. Uh, built a windbreak and uh, piled in there. And I think it was a couple of days uh, before they got back out there. So I, no book, no nothing. Uh, Cause I just didn't have any extra weight. I uh, literally just sat there in that tent and rode that storm out for, I think the storm was like a day and then got out in glass, but I never ventured far from the uh, outside of the tent. But that was, that was the kickoff. Um, when they got there, we, I hadn't seen any bears. That we didn't see any bears. It's really, it was decently cold, mm-hmm. and uh, we we struggled for I want to say two days, three days, and, and you know ice is piling up on the tent and all that. And eventually, we uh, we saw one bear, and he was three and a half, four miles away through a gully, like a, through a river bottom. Mm-hmm. And we went after him, and Vance is just really good at what he does, and uh, got over there, and. Um, got over there and uh the the bear was what he said it was and we closed i can't believe he found it because this bear was walking i mean yeah. it's just the odds of meeting back i mean it takes hours to get over there right right i was i was just gonna say i mean like you know that's not i mean that's you know if you think about it, okay it's four miles that's that's not a treadmill four miles that's you know mm. you know what i mean yeah i'm it's sure it's taking fucking uh yeah it's a soul sucking waist deep fresh snow breaking snow through the water through the frozen yeah yeah no, up, hours, up and down right? so it's yeah it's four hours three and a half four or five hours to get over there yeah um and we don't see him and we glass we try and get up high and then he sees him we go over there and we get two or three hundred yards, and he is over there. The bear is over there eating, eating two moose cubs. I mean, just blood all over. I I, I just set him on the tripod, and I'm I'm it might as well have been in there with him eating. I mean, he's you know twenty x. He he looks real close, um, and I'm looking through the the lens at him, and he's doing his thing, getting his wife set up, and this bear's just. just blood everywhere and on the white snow and i'll never forget that it was it was raw and it's in its form and uh anyway so i gave him the thumbs up and you know was on him and ready for the party the bear was kind of tucked in these trees and i we could see him but it wasn't what we wanted and he hit the, hit the squeaker call and uh this bear turns just when he turned blood just it was great and he turns and he was going to leave those two moose calves to come to a freaking rabbit call. And that's how juiced up he was. <laughs> um, and he turns and then he runs, I don't know, eight or 10, 15 yards. And he hits deep mm-hmm. snow as he starts to come to us and he stops. And, uh, anyway, she shoots him and 
and we go over there and it's a freaking you know it's a b and c bear I mean, it's just an absolute thumper and then he's caught and killed those two moose calves and was eating them and we have to build a fire and skin him all night and uh getting him out we we have to go back and and with the weight now that was now in lance's pack in my pack combined mm-hmm. we uh we couldn't stay on top of the snow yeah. so we kept so- falling through and we just couldn't get it so we had to hack out a runway and uh called in the guy and he he we put my backpack down and he made three or four passes and Rance is on the radio with him and said, he says, I can't do it. I can't put it down. And, uh, and he said, Gaines is going to put his red backpack down. You got to put the wheels right on the backpack. So I'm sitting there filming all this and he sure. sure did. He put the wheels on the backpack and then touched it down and we got out of there. So literally the, I mean, you literally had the plane fly back in to, to get you guys and then get the bear hide and everything out of there. Like, I mean, literally like right mm-hmm. to you. Wow. Yeah, How? and not from where he dropped us off. And right. It, it was just, we just weren't going to make it back there. Well, I mean, yeah, we weren't going to make it back there. Right, you right. So I mean? you you'd said what you were, I mean, at least, what, three or four miles out? I mean, just to get to the bear? So, I mean, that's... No, no, no. We were three or four miles from where we were camped. We were we were still a little further to get to where the plane could have gotten down. Oh, I see. So okay. it was, it was going to be a thing, but we were not going to make that trip back. No. Yeah. I mean, I, I just if I'm thinking about the just just the bear hide i mean uh, how, how do you even carry that out i mean is that in like two bags to both of you kind of i mean hey, how, how no, does that work no it's rolled up i mean the skull is taken out so the skull's mm-hmm. taken out and then the hide is there and the hide on a bear that big is yeah it's gotta be massive heavy. yeah yeah and, and and his wife did her part and but I mean, it's uh, it's basically the whole endeavor just got a lot heavier because you got sure. a skull <clears throat> and the hide and 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 all of that. So yeah, it turns into a whole thing, and and we just couldn't we just couldn't get through that snow. It was just too heavy. So it worked out, and uh, we went. I want to say we went back to the to the sanctuary spot and, and dropped her off, and and came a new person. Wow. And now, I mean, in chronologically, was this more towards the end of your stay, or was this? It was the middle. The middle. That was one of the middle hunts. Yeah. So you're literally, it, and this is again just hunter after hunter after you know hunt after hunt. It's just just a yeah. constant grind. Wow, that's that's amazing. Wow. Yeah. That's yeah, intense. Was, that, that, uh, I, I should probably guy. I should probably change the word from intense or from from amazing to intense. That's that's a lot. I can't even imagine the work that would go into all that. Yeah, I mean, it was, you know, those guys are really good. I mean, I'm not having to hunt for those, you know, you know, I'm just there to capture. But, um, you know, those guys are world class at what they do. And, um, you know, they know they're, and those pilots are amazing. Um, I mean, <laughs> he, he definitely at some point uh, flew us off a cliff and we were falling and that caught our momentum uh, and got us going. I mean, I, it, was, that, it was not on that one. But um, one of them, he, we went right off a cliff. I couldn't believe it. I was like, Jeez. "Oh my god!" It was. It was. <laughs> we ran out of runway. We just went right off the cliff, and that was just enough to get us going. Um, so, oh my goodness, they're good at what they do, man. Yeah, you just kind of <laughs> keep your mouth shut and keep your mouth shut and and do your work. Um, but uh, it was. I, I can see the day in my head. I can see that grizzly um, turning to come to that uh, to that to that rabbit call with two moose calves and it just speaks to their aggression level. Yeah. Oh, I was going to say, uh, so, I mean, as far as the squeaker call, were you guys, I mean, I know you said you were doing a lot of spot and stock. Were you guys doing any kind of like, I mean, blind calling? I mean, I don't know if you would even do that no, or not, but no, is it literally just, no, 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 we would, we would only call to a bear that we knew was there and, and had the wind where we could control the situation. Mm hmm. And, is that for safety and, reasons? And, I'm assuming. And a bear we were trying to kill because if you do call to him and he comes, right? I mean, he's gonna come until because it was times where and I dealt with this in another scenario. It was not this this trip, but those bears, were, especially those bears that are in the middle of nowhere, yeah, those bears are gonna come until they hit your scent, and that's ingrained in them. It's amazing to watch that a human scent. You have bears out there that may have never interacted with a human being. Mm-hmm. I mean, it's that far out there. They may have never had 
a human being shoot at them or run up on them or anything. Mm -hmm. And if they hit your scent stream, it's like they hit a brick wall. Hmm. But if they don't hit your scent stream and they stand up and you you wave your hands and stuff, it doesn't check them up. It doesn't check them up much. They're not intimidated by that. But when they hit that human scent, it's like they just ran into a wall, which is really cool, I think. No, absolutely. I mean, like you said, and they, they they get pretty old, don't they? Oh, sure. Yeah, those bears are. You know, those bears we'd have been chasing were you know, 10, 12, 15 years old. They're old, they're old so, animals. Yeah. So I mean, like you said, like so you got this fifteen-year-old creature that, uh, you know, to your point, if it hasn't seen, I mean, the chances of it having encountered a human, you know. Being that low and to have that They're kind very of very minuscule. Yeah, like if it had encountered something, it would have been. It doesn't mean that it would have been some sort of negative connotation. Right, right. I mean, just like, I mean, it, to me, it's kind of like I mean, I'm kind of relating this just to my little scope of things, and it's like you know, unless there's a negative associated with the stimulus, like I mean, you wouldn't think that there would be that drastic of a reaction. But I mean, that's I mean, that's just uh, to your point. If it's just something it's that's just ingrained them. in them, I mean, yeah. They just, I mean, don't get me wrong; they may still come, but sure. Like, but generally it's, speaking, it's, it's like it's like it's like they run into a wall. Hmm. I mean, th- their nose is so good, and it's it's dictating everything they're going to do. And they hear that noise, and they're going to come investigate it because every time they've heard that noise, it, it's usually led to a meal. Right, right. Huh. And, and they they almost all reacted to it. They didn't all come, but a lot of them, they almost all reacted to it. If you could get close enough, they could hear it over the wind. Right. No, I was, and some we didn't do it. Some of them we didn't do it. But Gotcha. And, and I was going to say now, uh, I mean, what kind of distance were you talking about as far as, like, sneaking up on this bear? Inside a couple hundred yards. Okay. I mean, you have to because the wind's always blowing. They can't hear any. They don't hear. I mean, don't get me wrong. They probably hear better than us. I'm, again, no biologist. But mm-hmm. you're, you're – and, and, it's, and it's almost invariably open open hundreds like you know what i'm saying so you so he looks closer it's good i can get him coming mm-hmm. um so it's not it's it, none of our interactions for the most part were you know i can't see 15 feet it, it's open it's open tundra like out there gotcha gotcha so like like kind of going back to the distinction between brown and grizzly you know that my you're, you're i feel like you i mean you'd be much less likely to encounter like, you know, like a surprise grizzly in that kind of scenario then I'm assuming. Yeah. I mean, don't, don't get me wrong. Down by the river, there was some big nasty stuff that could hide a bear and did hide a bear. Mm-hmm. No problem. Um, I mean, it, no, no, no problem at all. Um, but it, it, it it's not a freaking jungle. Gotcha. So right. you, you, you're not, but even in the thick stuff, I mean, you're just not going to go through there just blowing a squeaker. Yeah, that's, no. that's a recipe for a problem. Yeah, it's it's funny. Like I said, as, as soon as I asked the question before about blind calling, blind calling to a grizzly bear, like I was like, oh yeah, you probably wouldn't want to do that. Hmm. But <laughs> oh yeah, you're not just trying to see if he'll come. I mean, because again, there's just multiple problems there. I mean, he comes too close, or you know, we never had anything like that. But yeah, you know, we're only blowing it once. We're trying to to trying to get closer or kill, but. Gotcha. Yeah, I mean they're they're an amazing animal, and they were, you know, they're coming out of hibernation and and um, and are are looking for, you know, they're dealing with girls at mm-hmm. that point. So that was a big thing: boars and sows together. Mm-hmm. Boars are covering a lot of ground looking for sows, mm-hmm. so it's a good time to be up there hunting them. Um, I want to say that just green scoring them. I think three of our bears made book. Wow. Um, out of six, that's fifty percent. That's amazing. Like, I mean, and like, yeah, they, I, were, they were substantial. I, how much, I mean, just pound wise, are we talking about? Like, I mean, I mean, I got to figure any grizzly is big. Like, what about like the, the ones that yeah. made book? How much, like, would you say one of those would weigh on average? You know, I, I think all of that, I think all of that can be and does get exaggerated. Mm. I mean, I just think it does because nobody's out there with a freaking scale to put those animals on. Um, does that mean that there aren't thousand pound brown bears? No, there are, there are, Mm -hmm. um, but it's not the norm. Um, I would think that those boars we were killing were, 
they the right way they were pegging out like seven foot bears to eight foot bears like an eight foot grizzly is a big grizzly um, okay. and they'd be five to six hundred pounds okay so definitely definitely sizable then but yeah, yeah i mean I, it's just one of those things that i feel like gets exaggerated but at the same time it's also one of those things that i feel is underestimated at the same time because when you see a furry 600 pound or 550 pound animal Mm -hmm. it's freaking huge i mean it's just huge yeah oh yeah it's huge so like to say well you know he wasn't a thousand oh my god 550 pounds is two and a half normal human beings i mean it's it's unbelievable (laughs) yeah they're big they're really big yeah, I'm, I'm sure the uh, the fur doesn't uh, make them look any smaller either. I'm, I'm like I'm imagining like a wet fox or a wet coyote versus a dry fox or a dry coyote, and like the size just you know just <laughs> it, it, you know whenever the fur's all bristled up like that, just makes them look huge. So I can you know, I mean you know, especially like you say you're yeah, out you're out there and just it's you know, a big animal. Yeah, yeah, it's a big animal. I mean, yeah. So I I, I think 600 pounds. I mean, don't get me wrong. Do they get bigger? Sure, they do. But I mean, I, I think they were in that range. Okay. Um, big paws, you know, huge heads on these on these older boars, and you know, they they just they they'd be scarred up and beat up in the face and broke off teeth. I mean, they were just they were just fighters, right? Missing missing claws and stuff like that. Oh, very cool. Now, <clears throat> excuse me. Um, I was going to say now, Gaines, we're coming up on time. I don't want to you know keep you too long here. I appreciate you you know giving uh, this much of your time, but now. Uh, I do want to ask, I mean, as far as, like, so, okay, you've, you've been out there, you've got to experience, you know, this awesome country, and, you've, you know, you got to see the, you see the critters and everything, you know, from a, you know, from behind a lens, you know, does that make you want to possibly pursue, like, a hunt for a grizzly yourself one day, or, you know, does it, you know, one of those things where, you know, doesn't do it for you. Because I mean, I know like everyone's kind of got their own thing. So I mean, from your perspective, would you go actually go and hunt a grizzly, or would you just you know just you no know, pass it? Yeah, uh, you know that's an interesting. That now that is a good question. Uh, I've shot two or three brown bears with my bow. Uh, the traditional, you know, the the normal way, Saskatchewan over bait. Mm-hmm. Uh, we, my brother and I got one killed on the San Carlos, um, on a DIY hunt. Um, and bears are interesting animals. Um, the, my, my take on it is this being a poor working man. Um, <laughs> I, I don't know that I would ever be able to run the gauntlet to kill a brown bear or a grizzly because the same thing they'll both eat your face off uh you know in in the perfect scenario Mm -hmm. normally normally they just want to get away from you but the only way i think i'd want to kill one as cool as they are because they are freaking cool Mm -hmm. uh and this is all personal this is not passing judgment on it because i'm all for anybody that hunts any way you do it uh the only way I think I'd kill one with my limited resources would be to kill one with a bow. Mm. Uh, and that's a low, and, and flat out, like most bow hunts, that's a low odds hunt. And that's a low odds hunt with the best outfitters in the world. Yeah. And if they tell you any different, they're probably kidding you. Yeah. yeah. So and- I, I, think if, I think if the stars ever aligned, and I would go give it a run with a bow. I wouldn't be going with predetermined notions of size any you know any animal with a bow is, is a is something to be proud of mm-hmm. but i would kill one with a bow if if the opportunity presented itself okay no i, I totally get you i mean like you said too especially if you know it's it's not a it's not an inexpensive hunt too so especially to go out with one no. you know <laughs> with a with a bow it's got to be yeah i i uh yeah i see exactly where you're coming from Okay. Yeah, I mean, it's one of those things that you have to truly embrace the fact that you, you, if you're paying someone to take you, which you have to, yep. uh, or I'm, you know, but most people have to pay someone to take them. Sure. You're more than likely coming home without one. Yeah. Uh, I think that's a, I think that's, that's a good the only way I'd give it a shot. 
Okay. No, I totally, again, totally understand where you're coming from. And I think that's, I mean, to kind of just extrapolate that and, you know, I think that's a good, uh, Good takeaway, a good lesson to just to apply to any kind of hunt where, like you said, like, you know, you're going into that with you had, you had mentioned that if you were to do that, you'd go into it with no assumptions about size or anything. And you'd go into it with realistic expectations. And this, again, this has nothing specifically to do with grizzlies, but I think that's also just, you know, for everyone listening, like that's a that's something that took me personally a long time to learn, you know, just to enjoy the hunt for what it would be. And, you know, it just in if, you know don't don't set yourself up for failure i guess would would be the uh That's the, the takeaway you hit that right out of the park I, i'll be honest with you man you know having having been behind the lens having been a pain client having been a diy person and and then also having been a guide so i mean i've seen all aspects and i'm not talking about grizzly hunt i'm talking about big game hunting yep uh the number one most important thing is to know the realistic numbers because I'm a numbers guy and numbers don't lie. Know the realistic numbers of harvest and success rate and operate within the parameters of what's really there, especially, now this has gotten many a gun hunter and a bow hunter in trouble, but having traveled around, filmed the whole nine yards, pipe dreams, misconceptions, um, I don't know what other term I can use to describe it. Lack of respecting the the world you're operating in on a hunt mm-hmm. have led to more guys coming home tag and mouth than anything else, than broadheads, than bad shots, or maybe not, but close to <laughs> bad shots, yeah. to lack of skill set, to lack of animals, to poor outfit. The number one thing is that gets people is, not understanding the the dynamic and the place you're hunting and and what you ought to be happy with to to take an animal yep yep no well very very well said yeah and that's 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 very well put okay well i tell you what Gaines, i think that's a perfect way to kind of wrap up this episode i I could honestly just sit here and pick your brain about the other five hunts and all the other you know dozens of (laughs) hunts that you kind of mentioned but (laughs) dill absolutely if if, whenever you're willing man sounds like you've got no or uh no shortage of stories so that would be fantastic but um oh yeah we can come up with a couple oh yeah i enjoyed it Oh, thank you. No, I, I I did as well. Um, do you have any anything on the horizon for 2017 then? Oh man, you know Utah's coming up. Uh, I threw my name in the ring for Arizona, and um, I always go to Kansas with my brother. Uh, but we're going to New Zealand for a hunting moon, so I can't complain nice. there. Nice. Nice. So. Nice. Yeah, yeah, we yeah. Me and me and the missus, if she sticks around, are going to do New Zealand and uh, do a tar and. Uh, she's into a free range stag. I'm, I'm getting her into hunting, so I'm far more excited to see her try and get a stag, you know, out in the out in the uh, the free range style. I don't care if it's a freaking spike. Sure. Uh, yeah. But uh, yeah, I'm pretty stoked about that. And then we're gonna stay back in New Zealand and, and tour around a little bit, and then um, try and shoot a couple of these freaking, uh, you know, these. Uh, these toms uh turkey season's on the horizon and then i guess i'm at that point i'm at the mercy of the draw you know new mexico utah and yeah. see what comes down the pipe very cool well hey i mean no matter what new zealand sounds like a blast so that's uh, that's like like up there with like my t- like if i got to pick one hunt you know that's exactly where i'd be going so that's i mean that's awesome i gotta i gotta see I if i can convince I, my woman I, to I hop on board bad. you know it's <laughs> like it's one of those things uh I'm more excited and I'm doing far more prep work on my cameras and my lenses than I am like going out and, sh- you know, like I'm more excited about the photo ops of, than I am like as a photographer. Yeah. Uh, I'm more excited about the photo ops truly than I am the hunt. Is that wrong? Like, I don't know. But no, not at, at this point. Not at all, man. I, oh, yeah, I, I feel like I'd probably be the same way. So, no, that's, <laughs> that's awesome. <laughs> Yeah, it'll be a good time. I'm excited for for Janet to go there, and uh, I haven't been, uh, so we'll experience that for the first time together. But my gut tells me 
Doom on Barrel last time going. <laughs> <Just my gut. laughs> very cool, man. Very cool. Well, I was going to say, uh, again, thank you so much for, for coming on. Um, is there anywhere you'd like to shout out or point out to people to, to come, you know, follow you for, you know, the, you know, follow along on your hunts or any of your, uh, you know, your photos or video or anything like that? Yeah, I mean, uh, I, I post to Instagram. Uh, it's it's mostly my photography. Uh, anything can be anything from whitetails to turkeys to my crazy little shed dog Boone. Uh, but it's you know it's it's fun. It's a fun follow on Instagram, and it's super easy. Gains dot Slade G A I N E S dot Slade, and I'm like the only Gains Slade on Facebook. So super easy to follow. <laughs> yeah, I, I tell you, whenever uh, I first looked you up, I was like, man, that's a super unique name. I bet you he's going to be easy to find. So that definitely was. So. It, didn't, it didn't take long, <laughs> did it? <laughs> no, it didn't. It didn't. And then and then I pulled up, uh, you know, all the, you know, you know, Pope and Young score, uh, Boone and Crockett score, or like just this giant laundry list of things. And I'm like, oh my goodness, like I I'm, I'm never going to get this guy off the phone. He's going to be annoyed with me after uh, you know the you know 17th hour of the conversation. So. <laughs> Oh but, man, uh, I love talking hunting. Anyway, anytime, yeah. anytime. All right, man. again, I I appreciate it, and uh, again, just uh, good luck in 2017 and in uh, New Zealand, and um, all the all the good things coming. Appreciate it, buddy. All right, thank you for tuning in to another episode, everybody. This is episode 16. And like I always say every week, thank you all so much for tuning in. I can't tell you how much it means to me that everyone's tuning in and listening and and uh, that this this podcast has been so well received so far. Um, you know, I've just been getting a ton of messages saying that everyone's been liking the content. So, uh, you know, again, thank you very much for for the encouragement and I'll, uh, I'll definitely stay on the uh, on the path. Other than that, as always, if you haven't done so already, please leave a rating or review on iTunes. And feel free to reach out to us if you have a hunting story of your own that you'd like to share. And uh, obviously, you can do that through all of the uh, normal social media channels or directly via email. Um, my email is adam at thehuntsmansjournal.com. Or you can even reach out through the huntsmansjournal.com website at the very bottom of the homepage. So again, if you have a hunting story of your own and you'd like to come on the show, feel free to reach out and we'll get you on. Other than that, all that's left to do before we wrap this up is to announce the winner of the uh, gift giveaway or the uh, the gear giveaway from last week whenever we had uh, Mr. Garrett Rowe on from the Heads Up Decoy Company. And uh, he was gracious enough to gift over one of his turkey decoys for us since it is turkey season. And we figured we'd do a little gift away, or a little giveaway, rather. <laughs> so let's go ahead and draw a winner. All that you had to do to be entered into the, the drawing was to leave a rating or review on iTunes. So if you did, thank you for participating. And it looks like our winner is Bow Hunter Brad. Okay, so Bow Hunter Brad, thank you for uh, thank you for leaving a rating review. First of all, uh, if you want to go ahead and reach out to us, like I said earlier, through uh, social media or via email or whatever, feel free to reach out, and uh, we'll get your information and get you a decoy sent over. So. Again, thank you all for tuning in, everybody. This has been the Huntsman's Journal podcast, and I'm your host, Adam Huntsman. I will be going out of town this weekend. I'm going to be going over to Portland, Oregon to kind of do some hiking and visit some friends. So feel free to follow along with us, or feel free to follow along with me on that trip. We're going to be updating uh, our, our Instagram and Facebook live feeds and storyboards and all that good stuff throughout the whole trip. So if you're looking for a little bit of an escape throughout the weekend or even into next week, check us out on Instagram and Facebook as we'll be doing all those live feeds. So again, thank you all so much for listening. I am your host, Adam Huntsman, and this is the Huntsman's Journal Podcast. We'll see you guys next week with some more hunting stories. Hey guys, thanks again for listening. Now, before I do let you go for the week, I did want to give a quick shout out to bowhunterboxclub.com as uh, it's a new service that just launched and they've got a pretty sweet deal going on where they're giving away a ton of uh, cool stuff every month uh, for the rest of the year. For instance, last month they gave away a a brand new Hoyt uh, Pro Defiant, I believe it was, and now this month they're actually going to be giving away 
a, a brand new Matthews Halon 32. And right now, the uh, ending for this drawing is going to be next month, so or next uh, next week, so at the end of the month at April. So if you're listening to the, this now, I want to let everybody know that if you're interested in uh, signing up, it's a one-time deal. You pay the, the fee, and uh, from there, you are actually entered into a monthly drawing every month for the rest of the year to win some awesome prizes. Now, like I said, we're talking new bows. We're talking, you know, you know, I'm not talking about little stuff. These are very high ticket items, so it's a pretty good chance of win. You get 12 chances to win, and the fee is uh, is very reasonable. So, if you're interested in winning some cool gear or even signing up for their monthly subscription service, definitely check out BowhunterBoxClub.com. Thanks again for the extra attention, guys. Hope you have a great weekend. We'll see you next week.